really what we're doing here is we're going through and explaining what the differences are and where you're going to be able to use each type of technology from an application perspective. Before we get started, I want to say thank you to Eric, who organized this as our marketing manager. I want to say thank you to Parissa, who's our senior product platform manager. And I also want to say thank you to Dave Haight, who's involved in the R&D side of things, the product development side of things, and basically helped us make these products possible. What we're going to do is we're going to go through a bit of what you know, Sulphur is and why it's important. And we're going to talk about the technologies and also where we're, you're able to use the different technologies as well. So without further ado, we're going to get things started. And I'm going to pass this over to Parissa, who is going to give you a little bit more insight into the, uh, the application specifically and a little bit more information. Actually, if you can go down one slide, Eric. What we're going to do is we're going to, as you have questions, we're going to ask that you type them into your uh, type them in, and Eric will actually answer those questions or ask those questions as we're going through, so that we're not having um, continuous interruptions. Because I know there's going to be lots of great great questions, and we'll look for uh, timed breaks to ask the questions as we go along. So please type in your questions, and then we'll, Eric will ask them to the group so that we can answer them appropriately. So again, without further ado, Parissa, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Ian, um, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. So my name is uh, Parissa. I'm the Senior um, Product Portfolio Manager at Galvanic. Um, as Ian mentioned, today's purpose is talking about two of the main uh, technologies that we use common for measuring H2S, hydrogen sulfide, um, lead acetic tape, as well as the tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy, so TBLAS. Uh, what I'm going to do here is, uh, before getting into the technology side, I'm going to give a quick intro about H2S, as well as what industries are specifically interested in monitoring the H2S. All right. So uh, this uh, table here is listing basically a lot of sulfur, including chemicals, hydrogen sulfide, and other compounds that include sulfur. They basically exist naturally in the upstream oil as well as natural gas production um, throughout the world. So it's generally uh, very, very necessary for a lot of these products and uh, processes to remove these compounds from their refined products. The reason is that they want to make sure that they preserve the public safety, they reduce the corrosion in the pipeline, meet the predetermined agreements, as well as control any other anything in the gas as well. So when it comes to the H2S itself, um, H2S is a clear and colorless and really toxic gas that has a rotten egg, um, smell at very low concentrations. So the human nose um, can basically detect H2S at concentrations uh, below 100 ppb. Um, so that's why this is important. Um, really, caution must be used when somebody um, is relying to sense or smell, uh, you know, H2S and just rely on that as detecting H2S because um, the fatal concentrations of H2S actually anesthetize the sense of smell and that's where the problem starts. So the table that you see on the right side is showing what happens um, when we're dealing with different concentrations of H2S just in terms of the H2S toxicity effects on the body. Um, so as you see the impacts of the body uh, progresses pretty quickly and what makes the problem significant is that this H2S gas might be present without us knowing about it, feeling it or sensing it. All right, so uh, measuring H2S is really critical and important for ensuring, as we said, process control, product purity, environmental compliances throughout the oil and gas value chain. So there are lots of different important hydrocarbon processing uh, industries that are interested in measuring H2S. As an example here, you see a list for the natural gas, for example, you see in the wellhead, plan impact, SRUs, aiming streaming, um, monitoring purposes, underground storage, cost of transfer, and lots of other applications under that category. Um, and the refineries, um, so you'll see the NGL, LPG, SRUs, flares, SAG, um, scrubbers. I'm not going to read all the lists, we're just giving a quick idea as you're, um, you're aware. 
uh, were used to the applications for the measurement of H2S. And the petrochemical side, we see it a lot in the catalyst uh, protection, oil fans, syn gas, fertilizers, and much others. All right. Uh, now, when it comes to now measuring um, H2S, the choice of which technology really we want to use um, as application dependent. There are, um, there are a lot of other factors um, as well as the application that people consider. Uh, for example, sample concentration, sample transport and handling, uh, process conditions, reporting requirements, what is the budget, the total cost of ownership and all that stuff. So that's why it's important to make sure we understand what are the needs as well as what are the capabilities and the limitations for each of these technologies um, so we can help the plants, the clients, and people to make an informed decision when it comes to selecting the best analyzer to monitor the H2S for their specific application. All right. Now that we talked a little bit about the concerns and what is important to consider, let's go back to what we want to talk in this um, in this session, which is specifically talking about two technologies again, lead acetic tape as well as the tunable dyed laser absorption spectroscopy. So tape systems, as you know, have been really trusted methods for a long, long time in industry to measure low concentrations of the H2S. However, uh, the TDLAS is also becoming a very important alternative in some of the applications, um, which can meet tape sensitivity really in, uh, in a lot of applications. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna start with a little theory about each of the technologies. And then after that, we'll get more specific how these two are similar in some cases, what are the differences, and then uh, we'll try to um, give a very good summary and um, basic comparison between two technologies. So by that, uh, I'm gonna pass it to Ian, and he's gonna talk about the technology of lead acid tape and the theory of how this, um, how this uh, measurements work. Ian? Thank you, Parissa. Yeah, so I'm just going to go over the tape technology in general um, and, and just discuss exactly how it works and what the mode of operation is specifically. So if you can go to the next slide, Eric. What I wanted to start out showing is that there are a number of different um, manufacturers of tape technology out there. It's a tried, true, tested technology for specifically measuring H2S and total sulfur, uh, depending on how you configure it, in these applications. Now, there's different there's different advantages and features and benefits, value propositions, obviously, with, that we have even with our own analyzers. But in terms of the overall fundamental technology, there's similar, it's very much the same in terms of how they operate and what they're looking for for that lead acetate tape. So if we take a look at the chemistry specifically, going to the next slide, is really what it is that the lead acetate reacts with H2S, to form lead sulfide and then have acetate as a uh, as a byproduct of that. And so basically what's going to happen is it's going to react to the H2S, it's going to react, it creates this reaction. So what happens when this reaction happens? If you go to the next slide, really what you're doing with that lead sulfide is creating a stain. So if you're looking at the analysis sequence, the gas is pressure regulated and filtered to make sure there's no particulate and nothing in there that we don't want. Water permeable mem membrane humidifies the gas to make sure that it basically sticks properly and works properly when it hits the tape. Gas passes over and reacts with the lead acetate tape. And that's when it forms a brown stain on the surface of the tape. And really what we're doing is we're me measuring the rate of change of stain or color change on the tape itself. And that is directly proportional to the amount of H2S in the actual, uh, in the stream that you're looking at. So a couple other quick details that are important in terms of the measurement is the humidifier, again, facilitates the reaction. Again, so you're humidifying the, the actual sample itself. The LED light source illuminates the tape. So you're, again, you're, you're shining it on and you're illuminating the tape to, change, to actually measure that rate of change. And then afterwards, the gas is vented after passing over the tape and in, what's important here as well, you cannot have any back pressure or else you're not gonna get a constant flow of H2S or your sample gas 
across the surface of that tape to be able to measure properly. If you take a look at the, at the actual block itself, you can see some of the components where you have the aperture strip and the window and the sample inlet. And basically, one thing I am going to mention is that aperture strip or that slot that's there, that actually gives you the range that you're looking at. So if you have a very low range, you're going to have a larger gap in the aperture strip. If you have a smaller range, or if you have a very high range, sorry, you're gonna have a much narrower strip so that it actually only allows a certain amount of permeation of the H2S onto the tape surface. If we go to the next slide, basically this just gives you a, a general overview of the flow of what happens. You have basically the sample comes in, it's pressure regulated, goes through a flow meter, it gets humidified, and then from there it's going to sweep across the surface of the uh, optics block where we're measuring that rate of change. And then the subsequently is then vented to wherever you need this to vent to after that. And that's the basic construction of any lead acetate tape analyzer. Yes, there's differences in terms of how we do things and what, what we believe to be important relative to H2S and total sulfur, but that's going to give you the general concept of how the, all, all of these work specifically. Parissa? All right, thank you very much, Ian. Um, okay, um, so now uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the technology again um, for the TDL part and the theory of operation. Um, so again, this is an example of um, um, some of the most common lasers that you'll see in the market, um, TDLAS um, base, basically. Uh, what I'm gonna uh, do is give a quick theory of the operation about the TDLAS. So that's basically in the near IR part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we combine that with the use of our hurry up cell um, to provide a really fixed um, optical path length. Uh, this method is really fast. It is highly sensitive. Um, the H2S can be determined, uh, the concentration of the H2S can be determined by passing the light um, through the cell and measuring how much of that light is basically going to be absorbed by the sample. And from there, that really corresponds to uh, the concentration. So how much content, the more concentration of the H2S, the more light gets absorbed. And that's just simply according to the beer lombard law. So now the specific wavelength of the light um, that is gonna be used is emitted uh, by the laser that's controlled or uh, tuned by adjusting uh, or controlled by adjusting or tuning the current and the temperature of the laser emitter. Um, in the cell, uh, cell itself, you'll see the two mirrors at the two ends of the cell. So basically they're used to increase the overall path length by reflecting the laser light multiple times back and forth. And that basically gives us a greater overall path length. Um, so basically 52.6 centimeters is the length of uh, this cell and the light goes back and forth 100 times. So that, gets, uh, that um, gives us the 52.6 meters in terms of the cell length that we're using in this, in this measurement. Um, in terms of the analysis, so what happens is that again, um, gas is extracted basically from the sample probe as expected. It's filtered for any particulates, any liquid, and then the pressure gets regulated, and then the sample passes through the cell, and then H2S absorbs the light, and from that absorbance, as mentioned, the analyzer can calculate the concentration for that H2S and uh, basically that's how we, we get the, the number that we're looking for. Uh, if you look at the right side, you will see this uh, graph. So basically that's an absorption spectra for different species, including H2S. That's in the background of some other gases, as you see, like CO2, water. Um, so although there are some interference species here in the stream, when we, what we use uh, in our laser is basically a vacuum pump. So the, um, as well as, um, so the vacuum pump basically uh, makes a pressure adjustment in the cell. So we can basically separate the line we are interested in looking at. Um, then we also use a data processing technique that is called WMS, which is the Wavelength Modulation Spectroscopy Technique. And uh, using that, we are able to basically improve the signal to the noise ratio significantly. So the combination of that vacuum pump as well as the WMS makes this measurement um, uh, uh, easy for us. So we can go actually to really low, uh, uh, low PPM ranges with a very good LDL, lower detection limit. 
All right. So when it comes to the laser, laser can employ either a direct uh, measurement method or a differential subtraction method. In the direct measurement method, uh, basically based on the vacuum pump I was explaining in the previous slide, in order to improve the separation between um, the chosen absorbance wavelength for the H2S and other interfering species, the interior of the sample cell is basically maintained at a partial vacuum pressure approximately 200 to 300 millimeters mercury. And the way we do it again is with a vacuum pump. You see a picture of that um, uh, in this slide, on the right side at the top. Cell pressure is monitored also using a pressure transducer. So we make sure that um, pressure is always monitored uh, to be maintained at uh, where we require. There is no specific consumable being used here in this method. Um, the second way that uh, people can actually use the laser is using the differential subtraction method. So the way this method works, and you see a picture again on the uh, right side at the bottom. So the effect of the background gases here that could interfere with the H2S or address by using a scrubber. Um, that scrubber can absorb the H2S. And so first thing is the scrubber removes the H2S to measure just the background spectrum. The second measurement is made on the overall unscrubbed sample. So by doing this, then it allows to take the difference and say, okay, how much H2S we have. Obviously, the scrubber in this method is the main consumer, uh, consumable. And um, uh, it should be changed um, frequently. Uh, the frequency depends on the application, really. Um, now, again, uh, as a quick summary, um, that direct measurement is based on vacuum pump. The second one, the indirect one or the subtraction, is just using the scrubbers. All right. <clears throat> now here, um, in the next few slides, I'm just going to talk mostly on the similarities as well as the differences between tape and the laser. Starting with uh, um, analyzer calibration here in both uh, tape and laser, it is really important to make sure you're using a reliable calibration standard to ensure the best accuracy for the measurements. So the simplest and the most reliable standards are the bottle gases that have the known concentrations um, of the, uh, for the calibration. Um, choosing a reliable standard is very important because um, as you know, uh, there is chance for reacting, you know, with the sulfur compounds. So H2S, for example, if the, pro if the proper uh, gas is not selected, then the chance of the interfering from that calibration gas will be high as well. So for H2S, for example, in the background of nitrogen or methane would be the most reliable standard to choose. It's also very important to make sure that you're uh, avoiding using any brass component in the calibration systems, for example, if you're at like for the valves, for pressure regulators, for the tubings, flow devices, anything like that, want to make sure we avoid brass because it can absorb significant amount of sulfur, which finally gives us um, some sort of inaccurate calibration. Um, three, six, and sine steel can also be uh, used for the sample vetted parts. All right, um, next thing in terms of the similarity between the two methods is uh, when it comes to the troubleshooting of the analyzers, again, validation becomes very important for both methods. Um, we wanna make sure, again, it's important to use the reliable standard gas. We wanna make sure a reliable standard gas is used for that purpose as well. Both of the technologies require um, some sort of sample conditioning. Uh, wanna make sure that at the end of the day, the sample that goes to the analyzer is really clean, particularly yeah. free and dry sample. Um, so when the sample is extracted, basically, uh, some conditioning might be required to make sure that uh, basically the sample is meeting the criteria required for that analysis. Um, we can also always compare the results from the ones from the lab just to ensure that everything is good and reliable in terms of what we are doing. Again, uh, a little more about uh, sampling and the conditioning. Again, making sure, as I mentioned, clean, contaminant-free sample is the one we are providing to our analyzer um, in both uh, tape and the TDL. So, um, in fact, as you've probably heard that many times, 90% uh, of the analysis issue are in the sample conditioning system stage. So, on the right side, you'll see the <clears throat> example of the, <coughs> excuse me, sample conditioning system. Um, this is an example for the tape that basically consists of the membrane filter, 
pressure regulator to regulate the pressure down to 15 PSIG, and also some valves for switching basically between different streams or uh, between the calibration and the sample gas whenever required. Another thing that is important to consider is the probe itself. The probe typically extends um, to the middle one third of the pipeline just to avoid extracting any contaminations from inside the pipeline. So we drop the pressure right at the sample point. It's usually the best way to do it there. It's usually done by the probe tube where, uh, at the probe tube uh, where the gas temperature is likely higher. The reason is we just want to minimize the, any dual tensions effects. Um, also packing the sample transfer lines um, with a lower pressure greatly reduces the sample transfer time. Um, any chance of condensation will be minimized here as well. All right, um, a little about the sample transport part as well. So both of the methods, tape and TDL, they both need to keep the sample transfer line again free of contaminants. So that's all the way through, all the way from extracting to, uh, to analyzing in analyzer. Again, there is no particle, there is no liquid, no water, glycol, amine, liquid scavengers, anything that could condense hydrocarbons, you know, liquids. So anything that could be uh, causing issues. So the sample transfer lines should be as direct and as short as possible in both technologies again. Um, so as short as possible, as close as possible as that analyzer. Cold spots, um, if there is any cold spot in the sample line uh, where the liquids can be collected, um, that should be avoided because then that H2S is likely being absorbed by those liquids and that at the end be just red low, which is false. Again, liquids can also absorb that H2S and under a certain condition of temperature or pressure, they can release that and that basically can cause um, temporary false uh, reading on the high side, right? Um, one thing that uh, is very important in terms of the material to be used is salt inert usually recommended for the H2S applications because it's more inert than the, than the stainless steel uh, and other types of materials and that basically assures the sample integrity for our measurements. All right, so um, so far we've talked a lot about, okay, what are like the main um, concerns that we have in terms of the similarity for the two methods, the main concerns that um, should be um, should be thought of um, and, uh, in both methods are the sample conditioning, sample transport, making sure the sample is clean and nice when it goes to analyzer. Um, now, in terms of the um, comparisons, uh, the first one I would start with is the standard method. Um, that we are using are slightly different for the analysis. So um, TAPE usually uses um, some approved uh, ASCM method. So I've listed them here, um, ASCM D4323 is mostly applicable when we are detecting H2S um, down to um, one PPB, so on the lower side in atmosphere and gas samples and stuff like that. For uh, the D4084 uh, is applicable when we're talking about measuring H2S on the higher ranges, like first and level with dilution methods, for example, in the flare and biogas and stuff like that. When it comes to the TDL, um, so basically um, ASCMWK52082 um, as the one to use, WK refers basically to a new ASCM standard that is under development. So currently, TDLAS, um, H2S measurement does not have any consensus and standard method for the pipeline measurements yet. All right, another point of comparison between the two methods is on the maintenance side. Um, so usually tape requires some regular hands-on maintenance. Um, they are typically fast and easy, but again, um, in terms of the maintenance, we require just in general more maintenance in tape compared to the TDLAS. For example, for tape, replacing the tape roll, the humidifier section, uh, so that's a monthly thing. Um, that takes like five to 10 minutes. Um, inspecting the adductor, cleaning the aperture strip, as well as the chamber, um, uh, the sample chamber, again, easy and quick, but I just wanted to list those. So the frequency varies as you see, some are monthly, some are quarterly, biannually. When it comes to the TDLAS, uh, main maintenance, that's uh, almost maintenance free. So as you see, only replacing some membrane filters, um, probably every quarter, if there is any leak or issue with them. Um, the, for the vacuum pump section, just the pump diaphragm. Um, so that's an annual maintenance item. 
Um, if uh, a laser is using the indirect measurement, the um, scrubber, so that scrubber would be the main thing to consider as a replacement. So that's again application specific of requirement that's going to be changed. Um, so again, as you see, um, tape um, requires a little bit more maintenance than the TDL. Um, another point I want to talk about um, is when it comes to the, uh, to the calibration options for the two. Um, so you will see that um, there, there are different options we can do for the, for the application. So uh, one is the permission devices or the tubes. Um, that's uh, specific to tape. So the way it works, uh, you see that, like there's this, uh, you see we have a tube here in the picture. Um, so there is a small amount of that pure, that pure compound of our interest that is encapsulated in a reservoir. One end of that reservoir is um, sealed against a semi-permeable membrane. Um, the membrane basically allows a small amount of that compound to permeate at a known rate. At the same time, there is a carrier gas that is flowing at a known rate that can pick up that uh, permeated sample and therefore can generate a gas stream of a known concentration. Um, so this is more for the remote installations or for very low uh, um, uh, H2S measurements uh, that, that, or the low PPB, uh, very low PPM measurement ranges. Um, another way um, we can do the calibration is just using the prepared cylinders. <clears throat> this is used for both uh, tape and laser. These are usually certified cylinders with known concentration of the gases. I'm sure you all have seen them a lot in fields. So it's in the background of some gases, for example, methane, nitrogen, stuff like that, something that doesn't interfere, as we mentioned, with the H2S. The lifetime of this cylinder is about six to 12 months, depending on the concentration as well. Okay. <clears throat> Another um, source of comparison would be on the interferences. Um, so the tape, what we can do is, this is more sensitive to the high humidity. Um, for example, if uh, a cold morning, wake up, we'll say, okay, there is excessive humidity, so that could usually cause some stains on the tape to bleed out. Um, this causes the process rating, obviously, to be a little high. Um, there is also a risk of condensation at the tape. So usually uh, an adjustable thermostat to a heater circuit could be installed just to ensure no further issues is happening. Um, we tape, um, tape can measure H2S, um, as we know, uh, without any interferences from other compounds in the background. However, and when it comes to the TDL, so um, H2S can be measured in the presence of interferences such as carbon dioxide, moisture, and stuff like that. The way we can take care of that interferences is again using the vacuum pump, as we mentioned, um, in combination with that WMS that I mentioned earlier. We can um, almost have a very good uh, interference free measurement for that for the H2S and the other components uh, when it comes to the multi-parameter measurements. Um, for the indirect methods, again, the compensation happens by just using that scrubber, so the different, taking the difference between with and without that scrubber. Um, in terms of uh, measurement ranges, um, for the tape itself, tape is really good for the ultra-low measurements, such as 0 to 0.1 ppm, like 100 ppb. The lower detection limit, LDL, is about um, 0.005 ppm, so about 5 ppb. Um, tape can also directly measure um, H2S up to 300, almost 300 ppm. Higher concentrations can be measured as well. That just requires um, dilution. For the TDL, uh, generally used for the PPM ranges, um, so they like 0 to 10 ppm um, H2S, and LDL is uh, about like 0.15 ppm, so very low, but compared to tape, it's still slightly higher than tape. Um, however, depending on the cases, some um, person ranges can be offered in the TDL as well. All right, so we talked about um, some difference in terms of the standards to be used. We talked about, um, about interferences. We talked about um, some calibration options for the two maintenance options as the differences so far. So what I want to talk about now is uh, differences in terms of the response times. So in general, tape is uh, slower compared to the TDL. TDL is very fast. Um, tape systems require typically three to four minutes to perform a, a single analysis cycle. So that's usually based on a fixed time interval method. 
for the rate of the same formation. So that's basically the most common um, that is uh, that's being used with the tape. Um, the analysis sequence can be a lot faster when you're using a peak detection method. And this method, we just calculate the maximum rate of the same formation, regardless of the sample intervals. Again, uh, talking about uh, it's a matter of minutes for the measurement, a um, few minutes. Um, however, for the TDL, uh, it's much faster response time. Normally, we talk about like 30 seconds. It depends, again, on uh, what we're talking about. Well, we say less than 30 seconds. Um, this is specifically very good and beneficial for applications that require maximum uptime. Another point of uh, comparison is on the configuration side. So well, for the multi-parameter configuration, um, tape systems can be configured to measure total sulfur as well as the H2S. Uh, everything is performed in the same unit for the same stream. So one unit can take care of all of them. Um, this is very useful for applications like cost of transfer that asks for H2S as well as total sulfur, for example. For the TDL, that could be also configured to do additional components, uh, basically um, moisture and carbon dioxide, for example, on top of the H2S, again, in the same um, unit, depending on um, the laser we are considering. But that, that, that's how the TDL works. So H2S, CO2, moisture, all in one unit. That's a very beneficial, again, uh, this one for natural gas pipeline application, for example. When it comes to the multi-stream configurations, um, so both of them have the capability to handle multi-stream, to switch between the streams. Both of them can go up to four streams in the same unit. Um, so that makes it very convenient, usually, to monitor multiple streams um, using a single analyzer. So again, both of them can do multi-components as well as multi-streams in the same unit. Um, in terms of uh, uh, when there is a problem, when there is any sour event um, recovery needed, so tape can usually do better in the liquid excursions. Uh, it does better than TDLAS. Um, all that is required is basically purging and drawing the sample lines um, along uh, with replacing the tape rule. Um, for the TDL, that usually requir requires, in this case, uh, laser assembly to be disassembled in order to clean the mirrors, um, stuff like that. Sometimes, rarely, cell might uh, need some attention as well and some cleaning or some basically, um, uh, you know, a little bit more maintenance in this um, in these issues. TDL generally handles our uh, gas events better than tape. In the case of um, sulfonate-coated components, uh, they basically prevent any corrosion. And um, also, after some purging time, they're just back online very easy. Um, tape systems with a high H2S in the sample um, or in the cabinet just require some entire tape rule to be replaced a little bit beyond that. So again, the point here is that in terms of the excursions or the events that are not wanted, so tape does better in handling the liquids, and TDL does better in handling the gases. That's the whole point of um, this discussion here. In uh, terms of the application, that's another uh, um, point to pay attention. So there are certain applications that greatly benefit uh, one technology over the other. Um, for example, uh, tape uh, might work fine for certain natural gas applications. Um, however, when it comes to the speed, then TDL does a better job. Um, there's some applications that obviously uh, both technologies would work mm, well. Decision in that case is uh, based on the needs of that specific project. Um, refineries that have catalytic reformer, for example, for the catalytic reformer applications, um, so what they do is uh, they should monitor their H2S in the recycled hydrogen stream just to avoid the, uh, you know, the levels that could poison the catalyst in the reactors. Um, so in this case, tape is a very good option because obviously it can go really low soft PPM concentration um, measurement uh, with a really great accuracy. On the other hand, um, for the EPA regulations, for example, that require the refineries to monitor the um, fuel gas for the H2S more frequently than laser could be a great option because of uh, fast response and the minimal hands-on time that is required in this application. All right, um, so what we did here is that uh, we basically went through um, a lot of, um, so we, we talked about the theories, went through a lot of points for comparing uh, the two technologies, what is similar between them, 
what is different in terms of the differences, uh, we talked about again interferences, uh, we talked about the applications, talked about maintenance and um, speed and all that stuff. What I like specifically about this slide is it's a good summary just to put everything together for the main points. When it comes to the measurement, um, as I mentioned, so let us say tape has a really lower uh, dete uh, low detection limit and the, and the tape is much lower than the TDL. So we can talk about 5 ppb um, compared to 0 0.15 ppm for the H2S measurement uh, between the two uh, methods. Response time, as we said, is um, faster when it comes to the TDL, like about let's say, less than 30 seconds compared to the tape, it's a few minutes. Um, for interferences, they're both safe. Um, so in TDL, uh, basically, um, as I mentioned, again, using the vacuum pump or uh, using the scrubber in the indirect measurements. Um, so we can take care of that part. Um, and the tape, you're not worried about it. So the H2S, the way the tape measures that, uh, is basically it's uh, almost interference free. We talked about that humidity that could cause some issues um, and how to take care of that. Configuration um, size, so they both can do the multi-stream um, for the multi-parameter. Again, they both can do it. Tape uh, is good usually for H2S and tool sulfur. Um, TDL can do H2S, CO2, and, uh, and uh, moisture. Uh, in terms of the methods, uh, we talked about uh, ASTM methods for the tape, and then um, the, the one that is pending for the TDL. Maintenance wise, um, so as we see, so tape is usually medium uh, because because of the consumables we talked about, so tape and a bunch of other things. Uh, for the TDL is usually low maintenance because um, there is no consumable there, especially if you use a direct method. Uh, the consumable for the indirect one would be just the scrubber, as we mentioned. For the excursion, again, tape can handle the liquids better. TDL can handle gases better. In terms of the investment, so uh, tape is considered uh, low short term, then medium, uh, but for the TDL, usually uh, we say that um, short term is medium, but then again, longer term would be low because then uh, obviously you don't have the consumable and other stuff to worry about. Um, so, um, and the next webinar that is coming soon, I wanted to use this opportunity and mention that we will be specifically focusing on the multi-parameter measurement using the TDLAS. Um, so if you're interested to know about that, you can obviously sign up and um, we'll have a focus on the multi-parameter measurements using laser. If you need any specific supporting material or any application note, anything regarding what we discussed today, please feel free um, to get in touch and we will provide the best we can to support you. Um, again, the chat window is open, as Ian mentioned earlier. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in. Um, I also wanted to share this list with you regarding so who are the regional sales managers, platform managers who are working on these applications specifically, who can support you, um, the sales team, um, as well as the local partners here, so reps, distributors. Um, Anyways, please contact if you have any question, if you want to discuss any application, any opportunities with us. Um, by that, um, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. I hope uh, you enjoyed the material. We look forward to working very closely with all of you and discussing all the opportunities with you further. And I think now we'll move on to some questions, Parissa. All right. All right, so uh, the first question that we have from our wonderful audience is for H2S measurement technology analyzers, how do manufacturers determine the error and accuracy statements? We obviously, uh, Rhonda, so we obviously do the calibrations in our facilities just to make sure that we can address those, um, uh, the we can measure the accuracy and all that stuff. As well, we compare them with the uh, with the test results, and we make sure that um, we calculate the accuracy as well as the ranges and everything based on these two resources. Perfect. Uh, another question that just came up: a compared uh, tape versus TDL, which technology is more susceptible to false positives or high reading errors? Um, 
I would say it depends. Um, so as we mentioned, um, for the TDL, we will have opportunity uh, or the chances for high rating if, as I said, like um, let's assume as an example, there is a liquid that can that has absorbed some HUS, the material basically there, so that can release that HUS and rate higher um, after that release. In the tape, that humidity that we mentioned that can cause um, false rating. So I would say that it depends on the condition and the situation and the uh, the material construction, like what materials are being used. Thank you. And when you run calibration gas for a tape analyzer for, if you are interested in the total sulfur option, um, which sulfur components do you recommend to use? Meaning what would be the, the calibration standard? Um, for the for the H two O, so basically, depending again on the composition and on that application, what we can say is that um, fifty to seventy percent or eighty percent of water gas, depending on what is the highest. So we look at the um, the application based on that stream. 75, 80 percent of whatever that is the dominant um, composition in that stream and uh, in the background of um, something that doesn't absorb, like nitronized stream for, for the tape would be the one that is recommended the most. Okay. Uh, and Marissa uh, or Eric? Yeah. Can you hear me? We do. Yeah. Uh, Dave here. Yeah, so I just thought I'd jump in on that question as well. Um, uh, I believe it was perhaps asking for a specific recommendation on on a, a sulfur compound for total sulfur. And uh, typically we can use uh, H2S because it is in fact a sulfur bearing compound. Um, however, if you're, uh, it will pass through the total sulfur system uh, just as itself. It, it doesn't necessarily test the, the conversion uh, process that occurs in the total sulfur for the tape. So uh, a couple of other ones that can be used, COS is a common one, uh, carbonyl sulfide. Um, it's quite stable in uh, in mixtures of uh, nitrogen or methane. Uh, another good one to use is dimethyl sulfide or DMS. Uh, it's also uh, been proven to be uh, quite stable uh, in backgrounds of uh, of nitrogen and methane. Uh, as well, but one thing that I would caution against is putting uh, those standards, uh, those compounds in with uh, with H2S because you can have reactions between the two. And uh, uh, for example, COS uh, with H2S uh, in the same standard, typically what can happen is that the COS will start to convert over to H2S. So you get an imbalance in the in the composition or the concentration of the two compounds. So, um, so if you do want to use a, a standard other than H2S, uh, again, I'd recommend either COS or, or dimethyl sulfide. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. Okay. And feel free to jump in on uh, any other questions that you like. Uh, the next one we have is regarding the calibration gases. Is nitrogen always the recommended background or would any others work? For the laser, we recommend um, H2S and the background of uh, methane. Um, so again, like 75%, 80% of the full scale or the, high, the alarm point, set alarm point. Um, 80% of that in the background of the methane would be recommended. I assume that for the tape, uh, it would be in the background of the nitrogen, unless uh, it corrects me on that one. Am I correct? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, nitrogen uh, works well for the tape. You, you could also use methane for the tape as well. Perfect. And for both tape systems as well as TDL systems, how much gas is generally vented to atmosphere um, when operating each device? I assume it should be pretty low. I do not have an exact number on uh, how much would be the, the outlet. Um, Dave, do you have any specific number? Yeah, right? I can give you, I can give you uh, numbers. So um, for the tape systems, it depends a little bit on how you operate uh, the venti ductor. So the venti ductor uh, was mentioned uh, briefly by Ian. I'll just expand on that a little bit. Basically, that's a, a that venti ductor creates a small amount of vacuum uh, on the outlet of the sample chamber of the tape system, and it pushes it through an eductor block and then out to atmosphere. Uh, but that eductor block needs a gas to drive it. So in situations where you are uh, driving that eductor with instrument air, uh, the eductor 
consumption is about a thousand uh, cc's per minute or about one liter a minute. The actual flow of sample gas through the tape analyzer is on the order of about 100 cc's per minute or about 0.1 liters per minute. So uh, in the case where you're using air to drive the adductor, your emission from the analyzer is uh, about a little over a liter a minute of gas flow of which about uh, 100 cc's per minute of that is sample. If you don't have instrument air, you can run the adductor on your sample gas. Uh, so if that's the case, then your emission would be on the order of 1.1 liters per minute of actual sample. The uh, TDLAS system um, typically is running on the order of one liter to three liters per minute of gas. Um, so that is uh, uh, gas that flows through the cell is basically uh, what's going out the vent and, and it can be vented to, uh, to atmosphere. Uh, the TDLAS is a little more forgiving on back pressure, so you can uh, put out the, uh, the uh, effluent from the cell into a low pressure flare if you have one available. Got it. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next question, is it possible to measure H2S in liquid phase samples using the tape method? Yes, um, to, to a certain degree, it is possible. Um, the the tape itself uh, is making its its uh, measurement at atmospheric conditions, so atmospheric pressure and atmospheric temperature. So as long as you can convert that sample into something that will stay in the vapor phase at those conditions, you can measure it. And this typically limits us to measuring um, the H2S and or the total sulfur in hydrocarbons, typically up to C4. Uh, anything that's much heavier than that gets a little bit too difficult to, to vaporize. Got it, thank you. Uh, for um, the sample transport, what is the recommended thickness for tubing? Um, yeah, so uh, in a sample transport system, dead volume is your enemy. So typically in most natural gas type applications, we recommend using one eighth inch transfer lines, um, simply because they are, uh, uh, provide less, less volume. Um, quarter inch is, is also okay. Um, one thing to bear in mind when you're designing a transport system is to consider the fast loop. So um, if you have a fairly long transfer line that has a lot of dead volume in it, you're gonna want to make sure that you have uh, a fast loop. So basically a fast loop is a uh, sort of a, a bypass that allows you to flow gases at a higher rate than the analyzer will actually accept so that you're continuously refreshing the gas that goes into the, uh, that goes into the analyzer. So you wanna make sure you have a, a timely and representative sample. Sure. And for uh, this, you know, the sample transport tubing, um, do we always recommend coating that with some type of sulfur inert material to ensure there's no absorption? And if yes, below which, uh, you know, PPM range would you recommend using sulfur inert? I think that would depend on the concentration of the H2S. For example, when you're dealing with a really low concentration of the H2S, you don't want you want to make sure that that doesn't get absorbed somewhere. So sulfur would definitely be required. Um, when it comes to the really high concentration, I assume like or any excursion cases that happen, if really you're flooding anything with the H2S, again you want to make sure that that's going to be released uh, right away, and then uh, um, it doesn't get absorbed basically based on that. I don't have a specific number for that, but I think Dave can provide a recommendation on what would be the concentration right now. Give me. Yeah, uh, our recommendation is uh, basically for any measurement range below one ppm, we will insist on using uh, sulfonate treated components, at least in uh, in the analyzer portion or the the sample conditioning components that that we supply. Uh, we would make a recommendation to the user that the the transfer lines uh, should also be uh, sulfonate treated as well. Um, anything beyond or above the, the 1 ppm, uh, we typically uh, don't uh, insist on, on sulfonate. Uh, 
However, some users do have their own uh, recommendations on sulfonert and, and for example, we know that some users will insist on, on having sulfonert for ranges less than 10 ppm. Um, so uh, for below 1 ppm, we highly recommend it for above 1 ppm. Uh, we sort of leave it up to the discretion uh, of the user whether or not it, it uh, because it does add a, a significant cost to the uh, to the transfer lines as well. So there, there's there's that to be considered as well. So, uh, but really for uh, the applications that are above one ppm or for like monitoring type applications, the real advantage of using sulfonert is is that memory, that sample system memory, is that if you have high concentrations of, of H2S go through the system, it can recover a lot more quickly than uh, using untreated components. Perfect. And in terms of uh, using a sample probe, is there any issue using a double block and bleed? Uh, no. Uh, the uh, The key thing about the sample probe is you just want to make sure that it extends into the pipeline uh, to the middle third. Uh, I think Parissa mentioned when she was talking about sample conditioning that you want to avoid uh, sampling from the edge of the pipeline. So just make sure it, it, it extends in. There's many different types of probes uh, available. Um, I think the one that Parissa mentioned has the uh, uh, membrane at the tip, which uh, we like because it uh, takes the entrained liquids right out in the pipeline. But uh, uh, there's no real issue with, with using other types of probes. All right, and when it comes to tape analyzers, what is generally the best way to dispose of used tape? And do you have any idea of how often, uh, you know, standard H2S application would require the tape to be disposed of? Uh, we had it, uh, yeah, we had it, uh, probably it was, uh, yeah, if, if I go back here, I think I had all of the maintenance um, table uh, that is recommended basically for tapes so replacing uh, as, as a monthly. Um, that's uh, basically what we recommend or what we see the most for the H2S applications. And what's the best way to dispose of the tape? Yeah, in, ter in terms of disposal, um, there it does somewhat depend on on your local jurisdiction um, as to whether or not it can be disposed of in in a landfill and typically uh, most landfills will frown upon putting heavy metals uh, in uh, so our recommendation uh, is to to basically handle it as as toxic waste uh, if your facility has has uh, uh, methods in place for for handling toxic waste um, that's the best way to do it Okay, uh, next question. Can TDL methods measure total sulfur? So for the TDL, um, theoretically, um, um, there is no issue. Yeah, they can measure total sulfur. However, uh, there are some limitations when we compare that to tape. Um, tape, as Dave was mentioning earlier, the flow for the sample is really low in um, tape. So it's 100, 200 millimeter, uh, milliliters per minute. Uh, compared to something like in the order of two to three liters per minute for the TDL. So obviously to um, to measure total sulfur, we have to convert uh, all this total sulfur, uh, we have to reduce them to the H2S in tape and that's how the tape measures them. So when you compare the two flow ranges, you'll see that practically uh, there is more limitation on the TDL side or practically it won't be as convenient as tape. Um, uh, however, um, theoretically, yeah, that's possible. Another uh, point I want to add in terms of the comparison is uh, for the tape, after doing all this uh, conversion, there are some residues in the tape that tape is okay, immune to those. However, for the TDL, um, um, so it doesn't have that, um, it, it could cause some issues on the optical size as well as the mirror, some um, uh, we should take care of. Okay, and then someone wanted to just reconfirm for TDL methods, if someone wanted to use nitrogen as a background gas, is that would that work? Is that acceptable? I don't see any problem in terms of the interferences of the nitrogen. We recommend methane. Uh, I'll let Dave to comment on whether there is any specific issue if somebody cannot use methane and prefers to use nitrogen. Uh, yeah, we uh, we prefer to use uh, methane for the uh, uh, for the TDL. 
Um, the reason being that uh, there are some absorption features of uh, methane in the neighborhood of, of the H2S peak that we're looking at. So um, essentially you can zero that out by using a methane based gas. Perfect. And for TDL analyzers, generally, is the distance between the mirrors constant, or would this ever change if the optical path length needed to be modified? Um, practically, I think it is um, doable to change them if that's the direction we want to go. At this point, we're just using that um, cell length that I mentioned earlier, like 50.6 um, centimeter. Uh, there is no limitation to do it. That uh, down the road, when we work on more applications, uh, we can definitely um, think about it and adjust to that if required for any specific application. And for uh, the TDL mirrors, um, is there some protection against corrosion from sample gas? Yes, the mirrors are coated. Okay. And for TDL analyzers, uh, for sample conditioning, are filters generally recommended? For the sample conditioning system part, yes. Um, the, those membrane filters are basically where um, they can take care of all of those uh, particulates, liquids, and stuff that I was talking about, like the gene membrane filter, for example. So that's part of the sample conditioning system to make sure that sample that goes to the analyzer is as clean as possible. So yes, we recommend those. Okay. And generally for TDL analyzers, are the mirrors set up and aligned by the manufacturer or would a user ever need to worry about that with uh, alignment? My understanding is that uh, we ship them all aligned and we take care of that in the factory. Um, Dave, can you please comment if they need to do anything specific at the site? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, every, all the alignment is done in the factory. There's no user required uh, alignment. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the mirrors or the cell or the laser launcher or anything like that. All right. And for TDL analyzers, if there was a sour event, an excursion, can users perform their own maintenance on a TDL analyzer and clean the mirrors themselves in the field? Or is it recommended to ship the analyzer back to the manufacturer factory? I think there would be a guideline um, how to do that. Yeah, for the most part, yes. Um, if um, the issue is very specific on the cell or like it's beyond what they can handle, they can definitely send it back to the factory. But a lot of that part, I think they can take care of and clean up at the, at the site. The, yeah. the reality is the analyzer itself was designed to be field, uh, field ready so that people can do a significant amount of maintenance in the field on their own unless something significant happens. So for the most part, we've designed it in a, in a way that it can be done in the field at this point in time. Yeah, so I'll just add to that too. Um, uh, Parissa mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation that uh, the TDLAS is, is very good at recovering from sour events. Uh, so if you flood it with high concentrations of H2S, it comes back very quickly. The, the cell itself is sulfonyl coated. Uh, so that recovery is is very good. The thing that you don't want is the liquid. So if you had a liquid excursion and uh, it managed to get past the sample conditioning so system and flooded the cell, that's when you would need to to look at doing some cell maintenance. And yes, it can be done by the user, and uh, also uh, um, uh, if it can't be resolved by the user, then of course we can uh, deal with it in the factory. Perfect. Uh, and for TDL analyzers. Um, for applications with up to 4% ethane, would that be an interference on the H2S measurement? Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Uh, I was just going to mention uh, that uh, no, the, uh, uh, the uh, ethane doesn't cause an interference uh, in typically on the TDL, at least uh, in our experience, uh, using the, uh, the vacuum pump uh, compensation method. Perfect. Well, we are right against the hour um, and we got through the questions, so we are all set. So I guess at this point, I, I'm going to interject at this point and just say thank you to Eric and Parissa and Dave um, for, for being involved in the presentation. And I hope everybody uh, gained some knowledge and some experience about uh, looking at the different applications and the different technology for Kate versus PDL. This really ensures that you're looking at not just the technology, but the application as well, and what's best suitable for your application. For example, 
Low levels, below one PPM, down to 100 PPB, really should be a tape technology. When you're looking from one to 500, you can take a look at what's most appropriate relative to what the application is and what your sample conditions are. So really what we wanted to be able to do is discuss the two different technologies, where you look at them from an application point of view, and how to compare the technologies at the same time. So thank you very much for being at, the, at, the, at this portion of the presentation and listening to what we had to say relative to these applications. Just to one closing thought, as Parissa had already mentioned, is we do have another seminar coming up that is specifically around our new Accolades multi-parameter, which, which is three components in one cell for total certainty, which is the H2S, CO2, and H2O measurement in a single cell. So we'll be sending that out to you for, for you to be able to participate in that as well at this point in time. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. We'll be sending this presentation out to the people who are involved and who are online. And again, if you have your colleagues who'd be interested in this, we have another one next week of the exact same presentation. And they can also take a look at the recorded presentation online as well. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for participating. And we look forward to working with you on your H2S applications in the future. Everybody stay healthy and have a great day.